to go to the president's office at 5 p.m., which reminded me of going to the headmaster's study when I was in trouble at school, you know. So, so I traipsed off to the headmaster's study and, and met him, and um, what I would call an interview without coffee, you know, they weren't being too nice to me. And, and I was just told, look, we don't want you speaking like this. It's not acceptable. Uh, I said, well, look, I've been democratically elected. Surely I can say what I want. I said, and I don't think I said anything there that was politically unacceptable, that was rude, that was unparliamentary. And he looked at me. He said, but you called them pygmies, to which I replied, well, they're not exactly giants, are they? In future, I shall call them Lilliputians. So, so, so we'll see next week in Strasbourg what they do to me. But OK, I'm making light of it. But let's think about this seriously. I mean, we're talking here about a parliament which is now that it's got its Lisbon Treaty in force, now that it's got the powers that it wants, is starting to say that other political views and opinions are unacceptable. I think history tells us that when regimes write off those that are opposed to them, say that they're mentally ill, which I've been called publicly recently several times by senior European politicians, say that we're behaving... I was once compared by the leader of the socialist group, said I was behaving like Hitler in the Reichstag. I mean, this is what these people are sinking to. They don't believe there should be a democratic alternative, and that is why I now believe that this European Union has become a very, very dangerous thing. It is crushing democracy, it is killing nation-states, and I am very, very fearful for my children's future if we can't sort this out democratically. Well, you bring up some outstanding points, and we'll get into the police state and, and the loss of freedoms, and you talk about worrying about your children's future. I would be worried also because, as Lord Moncton said, we have these communists that are trying to take over the globe literally and create this one world government. Oh, I mean, look, let's talk about communists. I mean, we've got Baroness Cathy Ashton, the foreign minister, who, as you heard in that clip, well, you know, it's pretty obvious that CND uh, was against Western-style capitalism and democracy. Six of the current commissioners, let me just explain, the European Commission is the government of the European Union. There are 27 of them. They're not voted for by electors. They're appointed. And, and so it's kind of the bureaucrats, the unelected bureaucrats who are the government of Europe. And six of those 27 worked directly for the Soviet Communist Party. And yet when the wall came down, reinvented themselves and carried on with their political careers. So, you know, uh, Marxism, communism, uh, that autocratic, undemocratic style of government runs very deep in this European Union. And whenever I mention it, they do not like it. They howl, you know. I'd like to play the clip, if you don't mind, of the exchange you did have with the gentleman on the seat there who was, I guess, chastising yeah. you or correcting you and get your comments on that. Yeah. With respect, I think you've completely missed the point. Because twice you said the people that were elected last week, they have not been elected. That is the point that I'm making. And in the case of Baroness Ashton, she has never been elected to public office in her entire life. She takes an enormously powerful job. And the peoples of Europe, of Britain, of everywhere else, do not have the power to hold her to account and to remove her. And that fundamentally is what is wrong with this whole European Union. It's all about bureaucracy versus democracy things have gone horribly, horribly wrong. But, Mr. President, can I please come back and ask you the question? You seem to imply that I'd said something that was inappropriate or over the top or wrong. Could you please explain what that was? I want to know. Um, uh, some uh, uh, way of explanation of the way of uh, selection of the so important people for the European Union and uh, uh, what you say about the whole issue which is connected with that. It is just, by my opinion, uh, absolutely improper to the whole situation. Well, it is my opinion, colleague, okay, fine. When you were, when you were elected, yes. as, uh, when you were elected as president, you said you would act as a neutral president to ensure that all sides of the debate were given their chance to have a say. If you're criticising me on the political content of what I say, then you're not doing your job as a neutral chairman. Well, uh, OK. Thank you, colleague Farage. 
Now, that was the exchange you were talking about earlier, and it's very interesting to me because you point out correctly so that this gentleman is supposed to be an impartial observer, yet he basically comes down on you, signing with the other side that this is too tough a language and that these views will not be tolerated, essentially, mm. as he calls you into your office, as, as if it's the headmaster. This mm. intolerance, this inability for you to be able to even speak and say these very real things, uh, I mean, you did use the word political pygmies, but I essentially uh, that's very accurate i think some circles would say so what about this fact this lack of tolerance going forward how disturbing is that to you i mean i've been a member of the european parliament now for 10 years and up until a couple of years ago they kind of tolerated me um, i was a backbencher i wasn't leading a group as i am now and and i think they sort of thought well this farage chap he's just sort of mildly eccentric but we can just about put up with him because he doesn't really matter but when it became clear to them that the genie was out of the bottle, that the peoples, not just of Britain, but of France, of Holland, of, of, of most European countries, had realized that what had been done in their name by their politicians was that their national identities had been sold down the river. When they realized that genie was out of the bottle, that was the moment at which they became deeply intolerant of me um, and effectively uh, would like me shut up and like me silence because they know that when I speak in that place, you know, it goes out on YouTube and hundreds of thousands of people across the continent see it. Um, and they know that I am now standing up and speaking in most European countries for a majority of the citizens. And it's since they realize that that they become intolerant. And look, you know, the argument is whether I'm right or wrong. The argument is you cannot make a state. You cannot give people a new identity and a new passport and a new flag and a new anthem and a new army if you haven't got their consent. I mean, if you're going to impose a new nationality on people without their consent, well, far from that being a recipe of, of, of stopping wars, of keeping peace in Europe, I would suggest that examples like Yugoslavia show us that it's likely to do the very opposite. And, and when people say to me, well, Nigel, how do you keep going? How do you live in an institution where you're despised and sworn at in the lists and, 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 and all the rest of it? And you know, the answer is that what I'm doing to fight for British independence and British democracy is very much less than my grandparents' generation had to do to fight and defend that very same principle. Well, one of the things I find interesting as well, and then we'll get to the police state and some of these other things, is that this man, this speaker, essentially he fought against this type of tyranny in World War II, correct? So why the switch all of a sudden? It is extraordinary. I mean, the president of the European Parliament, Mr. Buzek, the one that was criticizing me, I mean, Mr. Buzek comes from Poland. I mean, up until 20 years ago, he was living in a country that didn't have democratic elections. He was living in a country that was under direct Soviet rule. And I just, it, it beggars belief that he can't see that what he's now doing is exactly the very self-same thing that the Soviet Union did to Poland for 40 years after World War II. I don't understand how they can't see that, other than, of course, to recognize the fact that if you come from Eastern Europe and if you get a job as an MEP or you get a job as a civil servant working in the European Commission or the Parliament, that you're earning about 15 times what you'd be earning back in Poland. And my theory is that... <laughs> the Soviets used to kill their political opponents, and what the European Union have done is they bought them off with money. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. And I want to get back to this desire to eliminate national flags and national anthems and replace it with this one union flag and anthem. I mean, that's outrageous to just have that destruction of heritage and nationalism. And will the people allow that? Well, it, it, it is quite extraordinary um, just how far this whole thing has gone. And, and interestingly, it's driven by a new phenomenon. And a lot of this comes from the German politicians. And, I, and I'm not being anti-German. I mean, I'm married to a German, you know. Yes. I'm not being anti-German. But the Germans are deeply, deeply ashamed and embarrassed of their fairly recent history. And I think we could perhaps say there's some reason for them to be deeply embarrassed and ashamed. Um, of what happened. But because of that, German politicians have not been able to adopt a tone 
that could be seen as being patriotic, that could be portrayed as being nationalistic. But when it comes to the European flag, when it comes to the European anthem, ah, now there's a nationalism that is quite acceptable. So, you know, when they play the European anthem, um, it's the Germans uh, or most of the Germans that stand ramrod to attention, you know, hands straight down by their sides. And, and what is now driving this European project and why it is now ignoring no votes in referendums, denying democracy, why it is doing its best to howl down, to stop, to eliminate people like me, is because what we're now dealing with is we're now dealing with a new kind of nationalism, an EU nationalism. And I, I personally...